the Chinese have announced that they're going to go to the moon. In fact, they will probably beat the United States. The moon is the celestial body in the night sky that is closest to Earth and is also the one that is easiest to locate. The moon's orbit and phases can appear mysterious. For example, the moon always shows us the same face, but it's always changing size as how much of it we see depends on the moon's position in relation to Earth and the sun. The rhythm of the moon's phases has guided humanity for millennia. For example, calendar months are roughly equal to the time it takes to go from one full moon to the next. However, the moon is not what you think it is, according to Michio Kaku. What does Michio Kaku mean by this? Do we still have some shocking moon-related questions unanswered? Can we actually live without the moon? Let's find out! For a very long time, people have conjured up various species or civilizations that might exist on the moon. The idea that the moon was a physical location a world like the Earth implied that the moon could be inhabited by beings similar to ourselves, and the publication of Galileo's telescopic observations of the moon had a significant impact on beliefs about life in other worlds. After listing all the reasons why life on the moon is unlikely, a 1915 astronomy textbook concludes, even with all this, still life in some weird form may exist on the moon external. Indeed, ideas about weird forms of life on the moon found their way into science fiction. When it came time to train Apollo astronauts for what they might encounter on the moon, Sagan was selected, along with other scientists and science fiction author Isaac Asimov. In the 20th century, as the possibility of travel to the moon became a reality with the Apollo missions, scientists explored the remaining possibilities of what kinds of life could exist on the moon. For example, Carl Sagan wrote about the possibility of lunar organics as part of his doctoral thesis, Fantasy notions of alien intelligent life forms on the moon continued in popular culture as the Apollo missions moved closer to putting humans on the moon. How was the moon created? However, the tale that is best supported by all the data is that the moon originated during a massive impact between the proto-Earth and another protoplanet that was roughly the size of Mars and was sometimes called Theia. This is one of several various moon formation ideas that have been put forth by scientists. According to this idea, the moon originated from the impact debris, which was a mixture of molten rock and hot gas that was thrown into space by the collision, possibly forming a disk of material called a lunar synestia. According to three different theories, the moon either formed outside of the solar system and was drawn in by Earth's gravity, the fission theory, broke away from the Earth, the capture theory, or both the Earth and Moon formed simultaneously from the protoplanetary disk, the co-formation theory. The chemistry of lunar rock samples, which were transported to Earth by lunar meteorites and the Apollo moon landings, can be utilized to comprehend the Moon's past and relationship to the Earth. Researchers like Prof. Nicholas Dofus, Prof. Andy Davis, in the Department of Geophysical Sciences at the University of Chicago, and Michio Kaku, take precise measurements of lunar samples to ascertain precisely what they are made of and identify the chemical fingerprints of various geological processes like the melting and mixing of rocks and the evaporation of gases. Because oxygen can exist in multiple forms, known as isotopes, and because different types of meteorites originating from the asteroids left over in the solar system after planet formation have different proportions of each of these oxygen isotopes, Planetary scientists can use oxygen isotope measurements to determine the different types of asteroids that collided to form a given planet. Since the object that struck Earth was composed of the same variety of meteorites as the Earth itself, according to Michio Kaku and some scientists, the oxygen isotopes may indicate that the impactor planet developed nearby in the solar system. Other researchers contend that any initial differences between the Earth and Theia were eliminated when all the oxygen that was present at the impact was able to flow around in the hot vapor that surrounded the Earth and Moon. Although many elements that we are not accustomed to thinking of as gases, like potassium, zinc and sodium, can exist as vapor at the high temperatures reached during planetary impacts, there are many differences between the chemistry of the Earth and the Moon. The concentrations of these volatile elements are much lower in lunar rocks than in rocks on Earth. When the Moon formed, it may have started out very hot with a deep magma ocean, similar to the Earth, 
and the low gravity and lack of atmosphere on the moon allowed volatile elements that wouldn't escape from a larger object to evaporate into space. This is one possibility. Another is that the hot impact debris had a long time to evaporate these elements before it clumped together to form the moon. An impact origin for the moon provides the high temperatures required to explain the absence of potassium, zinc, and sodium on the moon, as well as the opportunity for significant mixing between the proto-Earth and the material that would become the moon. However, when did this impact occur? Using rocks from Earth, scientists can estimate that the moon formed during a massive impact roughly 60, 175 million years after the solar system's formation. As large planetesimals grew, heat was released by repeated impacts and radioactive decay of elements in their minerals, enough to cause melting, which allowed materials with different densities to separate, with lighter rocks floating on top and heavier metals like iron and nickel sinking to the inside to form a core. The Earth was already divided into these rock and metal layers when the moon-forming impact occurred, but the force and heat of the impact remelted the proto-Earth mixing the separated rock and metal once more. After this mixing, the Earth was still hot enough for separation to occur again and form new rock and metal layers. This is the key to dating when the Moon formed. Elements like hafnium, which decays over about 10 million years to form tungsten, prefer to be mixed in with rock rather than metal. The first time the Earth cooled and separated into rock and metal layers was early in the solar system's history, so there was a lot of hafnium present in the Earth's rocky layer because it hadn't had time to decay to tungsten yet. By the time the moon-forming impact occurred, much of this hafnium had decayed. The concentration of tungsten in Earth's rocks depends on when the most recent separation into rock and metal layers occurred. The concentration of tungsten in Earth's rocks is too low to be explained by the metal and rock layers, but not all of the hafnium is lost because it has a short half-life compared to the age of the Earth. This makes it very useful for determining the timing of events in the first hundred million years of the solar system's history. Although scientists are in agreement that the Moon formed as a result of an impact, there is still disagreement over the impact's specifics, including the size of the impacting object, its velocity, its composition, and even whether we should call it Theia. Some scientists even contend that multiple impacts rather than one may have created the Moon. Planetary scientists will be able to measure new chemical signatures in lunar rocks and enhance current measurements as measurement methods advance. The more observations that are available, the more possibilities there are for scientists to test their various hypotheses regarding how our Moon evolved, how it interacts with the Earth, and potentially even how moons might form around planets outside of our solar system. Will humans ever settle on the moon? Few could have predicted that nearly years after Apollo 17's return from the moon, we would still be waiting for another person to lay foot on our celestial neighbor. In reality, the majority of people at the time believed that by this point, humans would have settled on the moon. While traveling to the moon is one thing, really living there is quite another. It would be extremely expensive, risky, and technologically challenging to send people to the moon. Since the Apollo missions, space agencies have concentrated on developing more affordable and secure robotic explorers. The link between the moon and Earth has been extensively studied thanks to these orbiters and rovers. But we need a moon base if we wish to explore the depths of the moon's mysteries and the rest of the solar system and the larger universe. Sadly, establishing a camp on the Moon is significantly more challenging than transporting astronauts there for a brief visit. Lunar inhabitants would not be able to transport all of their supplies and food aboard their rockets, unlike the Apollo astronauts. It would weigh too much. Instead, they would have to craft a large portion of what they would require for survival from the available extraterrestrial materials. These resources are sadly somewhat lacking, but with a little creativity, they can be made into practically anything a person requires. Making air that can be breathed in comes first. Unexpectedly, this is not too difficult because the lunar soil contains 42% oxygen. Robots can collect this oxygen by using heat and electricity. Already, NASA has created and put to the test the real-world prototype robots that can play this part. Water comes next, as any expert in survival training would tell you. One-third oxygen and two-third hydrogen make up water there is plenty of the first constituent in the captured oxygen. The second element is more challenging to source.
Currently, sending regular supply ships packed with liquid hydrogen and mixing them together is the only alternative. Finding water on the moon would be a better answer. Even though the moon doesn't have liquid water, NASA revealed in 2018 that it does exist on the surface as ice. This ice might be found, mined, and collected by rovers. The hydrogen and oxygen in this water were extracted by the settlers and used as rocket fuel. Additionally, they would set aside some for cultivating food, another essential component of existence. But this raises another issue. Can there be plant life on the moon? The only choice would be to use the lunar soil because they couldn't bring tons of the lush, fertile earth soil with them. This soil quickly erodes away from a plant's roots because it resembles dusty, extremely fine sand. There are also numerous poisonous metals and other substances in it that are bad for plant growth. However, tests with soil that resembles lunar dirt conducted on Earth have been promising. Human excrement helps soil retain water, contributes nutrients, and binds dangerous metals and chemicals. Only seeds and earthworms would be necessary for moon residents to transport from Earth. These worms play a crucial role in developing a viable lunar agricultural ecology because they recycle organic matter and enhance soil structure. In addition to the fundamental need for a steady supply of air, water, and food, settlers would also need to think about a long-term power source and a permanent home. Fortunately, the lunar soil saves them both once more. It has practically every component required to construct solar panels, an endless and sustainable source of electricity. The only challenge with harnessing solar electricity on the moon is making it through the 354-hour lunar night because there are no clouds to hinder efficiency. This energy can be stored in solar batteries, but they are too heavy to be launched from Earth. This is the reason why picking a high point on one of the moon's poles as a prospective base has been suggested. There, the base might have continuous sunlight and power, except from infrequent brief lunar eclipses. It would also be where the ice of the moon is found. The shelter would presumably be provided by inflatable or extendable constructions the settlers bring with them when they arrive. Compared to solid constructions, inflatables are lighter, smaller, and would offer more space. But they would also need to shield the occupants from cosmic rays and other galactic radiation, which may harm electronics and DNA. The best defense against these energetic particles is to construct a shield from similar-sized particles. This surprisingly suggests that hydrogen is a superior material to steel or lead. Engineers are investigating the possibility of encasing the ecosystems in a jacket made of hydrogenated nanotubes, hydrogenated water, or plastic. Lunar soil is, you guessed it, a less complicated option. Even if it doesn't contain much hydrogen, a thick layer would offer adequate protection from cosmic rays. European researchers have created a method for printing 3D blocks from lunar soil using just solar energy. These bricks will be used to create an igloo that will be covered in loose dirt. The igloo would enclose the inflatable housing, shielding it from both radiation from space and the relentless barrage of micrometeorites that the lunar surface is subjected to. Does life on Earth require the moon? According to what we currently know, life only emerged on Earth. This only adds to the mystique surrounding our existence. What conditions led to the emergence of the first life forms on our planet and promoted the development of more sophisticated, sentient life forms? We required a sun that was calm and reasonable, a firm surface, pleasant temperatures, the right chemicals and flowing water, possibly drinks served with little umbrellas and pineapple-shaped glasses. What about the moon, though? Is there any possibility that life depends on the moon? To the best of our understanding, as mentioned earlier, a Mars-sized asteroid collided with the Earth some 4.5 billion years ago, creating our moon. The moon that we know and love today was formed from a cloud of debris that was flung out by this massive impact. At that time, the moon was about 12 to 19,000 miles from Earth, significantly closer than it is now, a portion of its present range. The moon would have seemed 10 to 20 times larger than it does now if you could have stood on Earth's surface. However, no one did since the Earth was a molten, scorching ball of delectable lava from head to toe. 3.8 billion years ago, or practically the next day, Earth's temperature reached a point where life may potentially form. According to scientists, life originated in the oceans because there were suitable temperatures and plenty of water for the components that make up life to combine. The cube of its distance is the gravitational effect. 
The force of the moon's gravity to move the water on Earth around increased when it was closer. But how has this gravity affected our Earth and its inhabitants? Does the moon have to be here for the magic to work? As it turns out, its gravitational pull may have initiated the plate tectonics that led to our creation. Our world might be more like Venus, hot and dead, without plate tectonics. It brings the oceans closer to the equator in level. Without this gravity, ocean levels would change and rise at the poles. Additionally, it has retarded the rotation of the Earth's axis. The Earth rotated once every six hours soon after it formed. We would experience considerably more severe weather if the Moon weren't there to slow us down. It maintains the axis of rotation of the Earth. The water on Earth may have been completely redistributed as a result of frequent rotations of the Earth's axis. Because Mars has never had a significant moon to stabilize it, astronomers believe that this occurred there. The tides, however, are where the moon has the greatest effect on daily life. That regular flow of water periodically exposes and then quickly hides the ground near the ocean's edge. This might have aided life's adaptation and transition from the waters to land. What the moon has done to life itself is one of the moon's subtlest effects. Depending on where the moon is in the sky during its 30-day cycle, nocturnal animals act differently. Prey fish hide in the reef during full moons when they would otherwise be more conspicuous. Incredibly, lions are less likely to hunt when the moon is full, and studies have shown that lion assaults on humans occur 10 days following the full moon. Additionally, many bats will be less active when the moon is full. Given how many species on Earth are impacted by the moon, it becomes sense to assume that life on Earth would have developed differently over the ages and that humans may not have ever arisen. It appears that the moon is still significant after all, important to the evolution of life and the geology of the Earth. Extrasolar planet hunters may want to concentrate initially on moon-containing worlds when they seek out new worlds and assess whether they are habitable. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.